Welcome to the Democratic Women's Club of Santa Cruz County. We're at the Police Community Room in Santa Cruz, and today is Friday, May 24th. Our program today is being filmed in front of a live audience with Peter McGettigan behind the camera. Our speaker is Mary Arman. She's the Public Works Operations Manager with the city and she's going to talk to us about a, an important subject, the city's response to climate action, um, climate change. It's the city's climate action plan. Um, she'll talk to us for a little while and then we'll have, have time for some questions. I'm Judy Warner, your Democratic Women's Club President. Mary? Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for coming today. Um, and I want to explain who I am and why I'm here. I think you were expecting Ross Clark. Ross Clark is the City of Santa Cruz Climate Action Coordinator. And um, he is off on some very important business. He works half time for the city and he works half time on water issues. And um, they had applied for a, a multi million dollar grant, and the person who was supposed to go to North Carolina to pitch for the grant who was the former mayor of Salinas, had eye surgery and couldn't go. So Roth needed to fill in. And it's for a sustainable agriculture grant, so I'm sure you're all <laughs> hoping that we get that. So it's a countywide program. Anyway, um, Ross asked me to fill in. I'm the Public Works Operations Manager, or one of two, for the city. Um, most of my day-to-day -day job has to do with uh, the city's recycling and resource recovery programs, but I also work on climate action and I work on a number of environmental programs in the city. And um, in 1998, when the city first got involved with climate action and trying to reduce our greenhouse gases, um, I was the staff person at that time that got a very small amount of my time assigned to that. So I worked with climate action directly um, for about seven or eight years before Ross was hired. Um, and when the city first got involved was in 1998, and Celia Scott, who many of you probably know, was on the city council at that time, and she felt that um, the city should get involved with a program that was called, a very difficult name, um, International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, which had an equally unwieldy acronym, ICLE, and uh, <laughs> So it's now called Local Governments for Sustainability. But Celia at that time said this is something we should do and the Public Works Department should staff it. And so it kind of fell to me at that point. And I worked on it a little bit here and there for about six or seven years. And then fortunately the city was able to bring Ross on half time. And since that time, um, a lot of work has been done and the city just recently adopted a climate action plan, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about today. I think all of you I'm not really planning to go into what climate change is or what greenhouse gas effects are because I think most of you already know that. Um, I, I will give the one sentence explanation. Basically, um, uh, greenhouse gases, which is largely carbon dioxide but, but also methane and some others, um, when they build up in the atmosphere, they trap the heat from the sun and prevent it from going back out into the atmosphere and it creates a warming effect and causes uh, temperature rise and water temperature rise and sea level rise and a number of other nasty problems like um, changes in our plants and animals and um, forest fires, flood events, all of that. All of those things that we don't really want to happen. Uh, some of the things that are local here, of course, sea level rise would affect us hugely. Uh, our downtown area is right at sea level. Um, so if it rose very much, we would have inundation in our downtown. The whole beach area is basically at sea level. Um, and then coastal erosion along the cliffs is another impact of that. Um, the other thing is that our redwoods, um, which, you know, the backdrop to, to Santa Cruz, um, are dependent upon that nice coastal fog that we, at this time of year, are kind of glad isn't hanging around. But um, they would be greatly impacted by a, a raise in temperature um, and might, you know, might eventually not survive that. So that's why we're interested in uh, reducing greenhouse gases 
and in preventing more climate change from taking effect. So let's get started a little bit. Um, I hope you guys can see this. I'm sorry that I had all the problems with the projectors. But um, the city of Santa Cruz has set some climate action goals for how much greenhouse gas reduction we are targeting to achieve. And the um, goals that the city has adopted are to reduce greenhouse gases 30% by the year 2020 and 80% by the year 2050 and also that by 2030 all buildings, new buildings in the city would be carbon neutral, meaning they wouldn't be adding any greenhouse gas impacts. And that could be done through a variety of mechanisms. Now, cut 30% below what? You know, you, you don't just cut 30%, you have to have something to cut from. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but we have established a baseline and it's based on an estimate of what the greenhouse gases were that were produced in the city in 1990. We don't actually have data from 1990, but we had 1996 data and we projected back. And then the last thing on the slide here is responding to climate change. It's one thing to know how much greenhouse gases you have and to you know, be working toward um, reducing them, but there are already changes happening. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get on, onto this quick enough, and there are changes that are impacts that we are seeing. I think the fact that it's very dry here this year, most of you are aware, we don't have much rain this year, and that's one of the impacts that may be related to climate change. Many people think it is at this point, but it's hard to define climate change in small bites. But that kind of thing is um, the kind of, uh, changes we're expecting to see. So you're not going to be able to read these numbers, um, and you don't need to read all these numbers, but I just wanted to give you an overview that, <clears throat> as I said, we, we did a, a baseline study in 1996. That was back when I was working with the program. I had a UCSC intern, and he basically gathered data on how much fuel is used in the community, how much electric power is used in the community for lighting, heating, um, uh, and that was broken down into the commercial and industrial segment of the community, the residential, uh, the city offices and buildings and functions, and then also transportation. And <clears throat> that inventory in 1996, we then backed off a few years to come up with our 1990 baseline. And then we've since done an inventory again in 2000, in 2005, and then most recently in 2008 to see, well, what's the progress been? In the city of Santa Cruz, we have a couple of things that have happened. That's a pretty long period of time. It's, you know, it's, um, there's been growth that's been happening during that time. Not a lot, but some population growth. But we had a couple of big things happen. Um, the greenhouse gas, emissions actually went up quite a lot between uh, 1990 and 1996. And one of the reasons for that is many of you, if you think back, will remember that the wastewater treatment plant, which is down uh, off of California and Bay, um, went through a massive process in the early 90s to go from primary treatment to secondary treatment. And that was a good thing because it puts cleaner water back out into the ocean but it also uses a lot more power. And so that and some additional water treatment uh, improvements that were done are a large part of the increase between 90 and 96. The other thing that happened in Santa Cruz, and this is um, kind of a bad news thing as far as uh, the industry in our area and the jobs in our area go, you, most of you remember, we used to have some fairly large industries here. We had Wrigley's, we had Lipton's, we had Salt's, Leather's. All those things went away. And they also took away that when they went out of business, a lot of energy use went away. And so our greenhouse gas emissions for the commercial and industrial sector took a big drop, which normally would be a good thing. And, you know, it is a good thing from a greenhouse gas perspective, but that's not exactly how you want to have things decrease is by losing a lot of jobs and business. So we have a big um, decrease in that commercial industrial sector and we recognize that that may grow back at some point. So we kind of left some room in that category to say, 
Um, it's not all a bad thing if we see some increase in business growth that leads to some increase in the, uh, I would say increase, but not increase from where it was in that sector. So in just kind of as an overview, where we're looking to be, and these numbers are really hard to put them together with anything that means anything, but our goal for 2020 in the city of Santa Cruz is to have greenhouse gas emissions just right at about 300,000 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent a year. And right now, well, in 2008, we haven't changed too much since 2008, we're at about 351,000. So we need to come down quite a bit to hit that 2020 goal. And just to give you an idea, and this is the real challenge in Santa Cruz City and Santa Cruz County, um, a huge part of our emissions are from transportation, driving cars. In effect, basically, almost all of our transportation is driving. Um, we don't have, we have bus systems, but those are also um, carbon fueled for the most part. We do have CNG buses in the, in the metro fleet, which is a great thing. But on this picture, that blue and that green is all transportation. So the blue is high, highway traffic and the green is local road traffic in Santa Cruz. And so it's probably at least two thirds of our greenhouse gas emissions in Santa Cruz come from the transportation sector. So we need to get really creative. This is, this is city, but I think if you looked at the counties, it would look very, very similar. Um, the red pie shape is the commercial and industrial wedge. The brighter green, Mm, little less than a quarter on the lower left is the residential. And then we also show the little slender green pie shape is the municipal. And municipal means all the city operations itself. So like the um, city fleet, the city buildings, the city wastewater plant, that kind of thing is just that one little sliver. And then the brown is waste, meaning garbage. And the reason garbage gets put into greenhouse gases is because um, the, when garbage breaks down, if it breaks down without air, so if you, if you have a compost bin in your backyard and you turn it, you're getting air in there, and you're not getting that methane smell or that um, rotten egg smell, it smells kind of good. That's composting aerobically. So if it's got air in it, it's not producing methane. But when uh, garbage gets buried in the landfill without air, then it produces methane. And methane is a very strong greenhouse gas, and so that's why waste is not a great thing. And that's the program I work with the most at the city, is trying to get everybody to recycle and reduce their waste and compost. And we've, you've all, and we've all done a great job of that. And so our little sliver of the pie has gotten much smaller. Um, this little bar chart is to show you that we have made some progress. So this is 1996, 2000, 2005, 2008, and then the last bar out there is to show where we need to go. And if you took away that top dark red section, all the rest of what's under there would be the goal. That's to show you how much we need to cut down. And it's a pretty big chunk. Um, so the, the large kind of brownish red bars across the bottom, that is transportation. That's the most, transportation. The green is the residential sector. The light blue is the commercial. And then there's a little sliver of municipal, a little sliver of waste. And then that big red bar over there is what we need to reduce. And you can see it's come down just a little bit. We started almost up by the, by the 500,000 and we've edged down just a little bit, but we still have a big chunk to get to. Um, so the climate action plan. And this is um, something that Ross has been working on for about five years. Um, this was recently adopted by the city of Santa Cruz City Council. The county also has a climate action plan, and I'm, I can't remember, I think they also recently adopted theirs. And um, it has some of these charts and a lot of this information in it. 
And even though it was just adopted this year, Santa Cruz goes way back with this. Um, as I mentioned, we started in 1998. Um, a variety of people that have been on the council and a variety of mayors have uh, done different things over the years as far as um, goals and actions to reduce climate um, change in Santa Cruz. We, um, this plan is really the same goals that were adopted in 2006. So even as far back as 2006, the city had committed to these climate action goals. And then recently, we also adopted another document that's called the Climate Adaptation Plan. And so, a little difference. People talk about mitigation and adaptation. And some people are irritated about adaptation. Adaptation assumes climate change is going to happen. We've already allowed things to get to the point that we have some warming, we're going to have some sea level rise, we're going to have some impacts and how do you deal with those impacts. So that's adapting to the change we already have. Mitigating, which is kind of a weird word for it if you ask me, I, I think of it as avoiding, but the climate action plan and the mitigation is to try to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases to keep any more stuff from happening. So there's kind of two branches. And to give you an idea of adaptation, adaptation might be if you, if the city um, thought that our sea level rise was going to be enough that it was going to inundate, for example, our wastewater treatment plant, as I mentioned, which is on Bay in California. The wastewater treatment plant is actually below sea level. So if you drive by on California, you realize the plant's down in a hole. And right behind the plant is Neary Lagoon, which is also a little bit below sea level. And between them and the ocean, there's you know, there's development that's keeping the water out of there. If we had a significant sea level rise, we would have issues with our wastewater plant having water, particularly groundwater, um, putting pressure on it. So we're already starting to talk about, as a result of discussing adaptation, what kinds of things we might need to do um, to, it'd be very difficult to move it, and so we're looking at ways that we can um, adapt to that. And there are some other major issues with adaptation. So um, the Climate Action Plan has, uh, it actually has eight chapters. Um, the first chapter is kind of background on climate change and what it is. The second chapter is about um, the process of identifying and inventorying our gases. The third chapter is a bit of an overview. And then chapters four, five, six, seven, and eight are about the thing that the plan is actually about, identifying what needs to be done, what could be done, what kind of actions and changes we could make in Santa Cruz to reduce climate change and um, reduce the impacts. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but energy use is one. Energy, pretty much, unless it's renewable energy, if it's electric energy right now, unless it's solar, all solar, if electric energy, natural gas, coal, obviously, oil, uh, fuel, fuel for vehicles, all of those things have greenhouse gas impacts. So the more we can reduce energy use in all aspects, better off we are. Sustainable transportation and land use planning. You saw the big chunk of greenhouse gases that are coming from transportation. And land use planning is in with that because Obviously, the reason we're driving around is because we need to get from point A to point B. Um, you've probably heard and read about smart uh, transportation, I mean smart land use planning. There's an effort to do smart communities and, and that has to do with trying to put things closer together so people don't have to drive as much. So you live closer to where you work, you're able to shop closer to where you work. Some of the things that Santa Cruz is doing with regard to this are um, some of the corridor plans. You may have heard about efforts to look at um, Ocean Street, Mission Street, some of those areas where there's a lot of commercial development already. Um, is, is it possible to uh, figure out how to put residential closer, especially the, resident, the new residential homes we need to build or or apartments we need to build, put them so that those people don't have to drive as far. So that's something that the planning department's working on now. Another chapter is on water conservation and solid waste management. 
Water conservation, uh, the biggest impact for water on greenhouse gases is the energy it takes to treat and pump water. And especially in our community, we spend a lot of energy and money on pumping water. Um, so the more conservation, the more savings there is because of reducing energy for greenhouse gas production. Um, there's a section on solar Santa Cruz, which is about renewable energy and trying to generate more power from renewables. And there's a section in the plan on sustainability through public partnerships, education, and outreach, which is key because it's one thing to identify all these things that could be done. It's quite another thing to get them done. And the only people that can make those kind of changes are all of you and everybody else in the community. Um, it doesn't happen by the city saying, this is what we need to do. It happens by people making behavioral changes. So, all right. So one of the things, this kind of document is pretty hard to get your head around. And so one of the things Ross has done is try to identify just 12 milestones that he can talk about and people can be working, working toward. And I handed out, or they were back there on the table, um, a copy of some of those milestones. And there's also attached to that a report that was recently given to the city council about some of the recent progress toward those milestones. And the milestones are things, these are from the Climate Action Plan. <clears throat> They're just a smaller segment. Uh, reducing energy use in municipal buildings um, is one, for example. Increasing solar uh, to, f our goal on that is, um, well, you'll see that in a minute. I'm not going to go through all of these. But suffice to say, double bike ridership, uh, switch 20% of cars to low carbon fuel. So these are things that people can understand. What, what are we talking about here? What kind of behavior changes need to happen? And the plan goes into more detail about what kinds of actions would help achieve those things. So doubling bike ridership, and that's from what it was in 1990 by 2020. Um, frankly, right now, we don't know what it was in 1990, so one of the things they're trying to establish is what's the baseline on that? And then, it's one thing to say it, but how do you do it? You know, what makes people choose to ride their bikes instead of, walk, uh, instead of drive to work or walk? Walking is good, too. Um, what, what do you do to get people to do that? And there was just, I just read in the paper this morning, there was a uh, meeting on that. Some of you may have attended that. There's a current process underway to try to do a regional transportation planning and sustainable planning on that. So some of these milestones, we're gonna, I'm just going to highlight a few things. One of the milestones is to reduce energy use in municipal buildings by an additional 40%. Okay, by municipal buildings, we mean like this building, uh, our corporation yard, the library, city hall, uh, wastewater plant, water plant. So that's what we mean by municipal. An additional 40% is over where it is basically now. And some of the things that we're doing right now and have just done, um, we're just about to receive a study where we did um, benchmarks on 20 buildings. We hired a consultant and they studied the energy use and the operation of 20 different city buildings. This one was one of them. Loudon Nelson, for example, was one. Um, and they're going to be recommending strategies to make them more efficient. And they're also looking at things that just need to be let, done. Does it need a new roof? Does it need a new um, furnace? Um, for example, the Civic, the furnace. We've known for years the furnace is in really bad shape at the Civic. And that the recommendations will be both for maintenance and energy efficiency. But the goal out of that one project is to reduce the energy use in those buildings by another 20, uh, by 10%. Um, many of you probably have noticed some of the street lights around town look different. And we have been changing our street lights over to LED lights. There's multiple, benefit, multiple benefits from that. They save a lot of energy, they're brighter light, and they're, they last a lot longer. And one, it's very hard to change the light bulb in a street light, as you can imagine. <laughs> and so anything that keeps those bulbs going longer reduces the maintenance cost of it. So far, we've changed out over half of the street lights that the city owns. So street lights are kind of an odd thing. 
The city owns and maintains half of the streetlights in town, just based on the age of when they were put in. The other half are owned by PG&E, and the city still pays for the maintenance and power on the ones that PG&E owns. PG&E is responsible for maintaining the ones they own, and then they bill us, and we do everything on the other half. So we've, we've replaced um, more than half of our, our owned streetlights with LED lights, and we have another phase coming up. So within a couple of years, there will probably be all the ones we own will be LED lighting. Um, we also have a new position that we've uh, managed to get in the budget and just hired, and that's a person to actually work on some of these projects. Uh, you heard me say Ross is half-time, works half-time somewhere else. We really don't have anyone in the city whose job is to focus on energy management and on facility maintenance. So this is one of the new things we've done. So another big goal is to increase the amount of solar power in Santa Cruz. And um, the goal is to have 2,000 homes and 200 businesses with solar power by 2016. Um, this building, right out there in the parking lot that the police cars use, and City Hall just recently got large new solar arrays. There were articles in the paper, and some of you have driven by them. Um, that will make a huge difference in the power cost and the fact that it's renewable power for both of these buildings. The one at City Hall is designed to produce about 90 or 95 percent of the power used there. So it's, it's a, big, a big system and it will be well used. This one, I think, is not quite as high for PD, but it, it and this is a very energy intensive building because it's 24 hours a day. So I think it comes close to producing almost all the power needs here. In Santa Cruz now, um, last year there were 44 new solar systems added on homes. We now have 577 homes in the city of Santa Cruz that have solar systems on them. And you can't go a day without seeing big ads in the paper, hearing on the radio the ads from the solar system. You probably get them in your mail. This is a big push right now from businesses as well as from the city. Um, and it's finally becoming a little bit more affordable. Um, there are multiple ways that people can, can uh, finance solar systems. The other thing we have <clears throat> is this program called um, California First Pace. Um, and I'm not going to try to explain what the letters mean. Basically, it is right now only available to businesses. It was designed to be able to be available to residents, and I'll explain quickly why not. But right now it is available to businesses. If businesses want to put solar on their business, they can add it as an assessment on the property and pay it off through their property taxes. And so it gives them essentially a 20-year payback period. Um, they can pay it on their taxes. I'm sure many people are going to write it off of their taxes. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's legal, not, but um, it's a very, um, and then of course the improvement is a, an improvement to the property. It, this program was designed to be available to residents as well, but unfortunately Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac got in the way and most people's homes, the loans are are financed with a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac and they basically would not allow this program to go forward on anything that had their loan on it because they said it um, basically created a prior lien for those of you that know something about real estate. Um, so we're still working on that. That's being worked at at the national level to try to figure out a way to get around that. Um, the last thing on this is something called community choice aggregation. Ring any bells? CCA? Anybody heard about it? A couple people. Okay, this is something that's been around for, I don't know, about seven or eight years, maybe a little longer than that. The state passed a, a bill that allows um, local either governments or um, collections of governments or regions to create a, a district, if you will, that um, can buy its own power for the people within that district. So right now, I'm going to guess virtually all of you get your power from PG&E. The city gets its power from PG&E. 
And if you were to just call, go out and say, I want to buy power from somebody else, you can't do that right now in California. And that goes back to the days when we had, in, two, in the year 2000, when we had the energy crisis and the state borrowed a bunch of money um, to finance energy loans. And at that point, they said, okay, well, until we get these loans paid off, you can't buy your power from anybody else. But there was um, uh, a bill passed that allowed local governments or collections of such to form what's called a community choice aggregation. And that, that CCA, once it's formed, can buy power for the people within it. So for example, the city could form a, a CCA and could um, provide all of you with your power through that. And of course, we don't have a power plant. So what we would do is we would buy power from somebody else and resell it to you. It sounds like, well, why would that be any cheaper, right? And one of the reasons it's a little bit cheaper, there, well, first of all, uh, there's only two entities that have done it in the state, and Marin is the one that's the most, um, has the most going on with it. They've established their CCA. They are actually buying power and reselling it, and they actually are able to save their customers money over PG&E. Um, it has to do with being able to enter long-term contracts and buy power locally and a variety of things. But the biggest thing with regard to greenhouse gases is those CCAs can choose to buy renewable power. They might choose to buy 50% renewable power or 70 or 100%. Um, and that's one of the things that is driving that particular movement is to be able to buy renewable power. The other really good thing about them is right now if you own a home in Santa Cruz or own a business in Santa Cruz and you want to put in, you want to cover every square inch of your roof with solar panels, um, if you don't use that much power, it doesn't do you any good. You're not going to be able to sell that excess power to anybody. You just put it into the grid and the grid says thank you and, and off you go, that's it. You're just basically spending money you didn't need to spend on your solar system. But with a CCA, the local Community Choice Aggregation District could buy that power from you and resell it to the rest of the community. And so that's a very attractive part of this. And there is an active group of people, Ginny Johnson, who used to be the Executive Director of Ecology Action, is heading up an effort to create a Santa Cruz County CCA. And the City of Santa Cruz has indicated that we're interested in joining it. So that's something that's happening now. It's, a, it's an interesting project. It'll take a while to get it going. Um, it's complicated legally, but it has worked so already in Marin. Actually, one option is for us to join Marin's, but I, I kind of think that's not the way that will go forward. All right, so another area we're working with is we have a huge university up there. They have big engineering programs and lots of young students that are interested in doing things. So we're trying to partner with them on, uh, particularly in the energy research area. And one of the things that Ross has worked with them a lot on is our municipal wharf. They are, um, they, we have what's called the green wharf and there's a couple of programs out there. Next time you go out there, look at the roofs and you'll see a small windmill. And um, it's the wind on the wharf project and it was very difficult to get a permit, even for a small windmill, but that's where it is. It's one piece of a larger effort to look at energy options along the coastline. Um, there's another thing happening at the wharf, which is fun if you haven't done it yet. There is now a, uh, an eco tour that goes along West Cliff and then goes out onto the wharf, and there are tour guides from UCSC that give the tour on weekends. So, um, and they're talking about greenhouse gases, coastal erosion, and also all the green uh, efforts that are underway. Another project is switching 20% of cars to low carbon fuels. Um, the city's in the process of installing electric vehicle charging stations. We have 11 of them going in. There is now one on the wharf as a result of that city UC green wharf program. Um, there's a couple of others around town. There's one at Ecology Action, there's one at Staff of Life. Some local businesses are putting them in as they improve things. Um, another area on the, that we're able to control um, is trying to convert the city's fleet to low carbon fuel. And so we have about 40% of the city's vehicles are now low carbon fuel vehicles. Not all of those are 100% uh, 
uh, non-carbon, but for example, our refuse and recycling fleet uses biodiesel B20. We would love to use B50, but we can't because there's a state law that you can't do that. <laughs> it's kind of like, hmm, that seems backwards, right? It has to do with the emissions from refuse vehicles. There's a whole separate law about that. Um, but anyway, we, we're doing what we can, and as soon as they up the numbers, we'll up the numbers. The other thing that we just did, or just have received, is we have a CNG refuse truck and a hybrid refuse truck that we are trying out. Um, we're doing a head-to-head -head comparison. We bought a diesel one, a CNG one, and a hybrid one all at the same time, all the same kind of truck, so we can compare them. And uh, we're hoping to decide whether or not we can start turning our fleet over either to CNG or to hybrids. And the hybrids have a lot of um, opportunity. These are hydraulic hybrids. And as you can imagine, a refuse or recycling truck is hitting the brakes a lot. Stop, 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 stop. Every time it stops, it helps recharge the um, generation system. So that's pretty exciting. UPS is using a lot of those. Green businesses. Um, hopefully some of you shop where you see that little symbol down in the lower left-hand corner. That's the Monterey Bay Area uh, Green Business Program, Certified Green Business, and that's one of the programs I work with. Um, there, we have a coordinator in the city, the county also has a coordinator, and uh, we go through a process of certifying a business in areas of water pollution, air pollution, waste reduction, energy efficiency, and also now climate change. And if they meet all of those criteria, they're certified as a green business. They get the sticker, they get to advertise that. We help advertise that. We have uh, 111 green businesses certified in the city, did about 47 last year, and we've got about almost 50 that are currently in process. So um, the, many of the businesses you would recognize are green businesses. A couple of other things that are happening um, as this climate action plan gets rolled out. One aspect, as I mentioned earlier, is how do you get people to do this stuff? How do you get people to make these changes? And so we're enlisting the aid of the community. Um, there were a number of groups involved during the plan development, um, environmental groups, community groups. And so a working group has been formed that's made up of members of those local organizations that contributed to the Climate Action Plan. Um, and we're going to be using those folks to help us figure out how to get people in the community to get on board and, and what do we need to do to help that process. Um, the, each organization was asked to submit names to the mayor, and the mayor has recently appointed that committee, and I believe they're going to be meeting um, in June. So then the other side of the house, internally we've formed what's called a sustainable transportation and land use planning team. And as you can well imagine, um, the city of Santa Cruz has departments and departments often don't work across departments maybe as well as they should. So I'm in the public works department. The traffic division in the city is in public works. Uh, there's the planning department. There's the economic development department. And then um, there's you know, city manager's office, and there's UCSC that has their own transportation and parking department. So, and there's the Regional Transportation Commission and AMBAG, which has transportation programs. So what we're trying to do is get all those people to regularly be in one place and coordinate transportation planning toward the goal of sustainable transportation. We're aided a little bit by this in the fact that the state said you have to do this, um, which didn't mean we did it for a while. We still uh, have put it off for a while, but we are working in this area. And it's really critical because we as a city can't really change transportation for our whole community. You remember that big chunk that was highway transportation? Well. A lot of that comes from outside the city, people coming into work, coming to visit. We want them to do that, but that doesn't mean that we can determine how they get here or how, where they park or do they ride their bikes, that kind of thing. So we really need an overall um, regional effort. Okay, so how can you help? Well, some of the things I've mentioned, um, we have this community choice aggregation project going on. 
If that interests you at all, I encourage you to um, get a little more familiar with it, and you can certainly contact me or Ross if you're interested in that, but support it as it goes forward. The good news is nobody has to do it. If, if someone says, I don't want to buy my power from that, I want to stick with PG&E, they can. It's an opt out, they you just send in the card when you get the card in the mail, no, I want to keep buying my power from PG&E. So it's an optional program, but it does give if it gets formed, it will give the opportunity to have local control over what kind of power we have, where we get it from, and to a certain degree, the cost of it. Um, advocate for dedicated implementation of these climate action plans. So we have the plans, but as you know, plans can sit on the shelf for years and years, we have lots of them. We have shelffuls of them that are still there. And uh, so, you know, if there's something in it that interests you, make sure that that goes forward. Um, the rail trail project, the, Santa, the county rail project, it, there's a bunch of things that are involved in that. But it has, and some parts of that people like, some they don't. But stay involved in that process and see what's going to, you know, what the opportunities are. Um, there's an effort coming up to try to do one part of a trail across the north, well, what would that be? The western, northwestern side of Santa Cruz where we have the rail corridor that would be a huge asset to bicycling in that part of town. Um, so even if you don't like the train part, the, the, tra the trail part could be a real asset. Green businesses, support your local green businesses. If you are a business person, and you're not certified, I encourage you to get certified. Um, support the ones that are. Encourage your local businesses that aren't to become green businesses. It really helps their bottom line. And it's been interesting to see what people value in it. And that's one of the things they value. They value the fact that mo almost all of them, their power bills have gone down, their water bills have gone down, their refuse bills have gone down. So it's a real help for sustainable businesses, meaning financially sustainable businesses, to, to be green certified. And then this one, there's just an article in today's paper about this. If you're not aware of this um, issue, it, read that article. So we went through this process in California that's called cap and trade. And basically, there were regulations put in place that large power users um, had a cap placed on the amount of greenhouse gases they could generate. And if they want to go above that cap, they have to buy additional credits. If they beat the cap, they can sell to a certain extent the ones that they've saved. And the state gets a good chunk of the money of that buy and sell process. Right now, and then there was a large amount of money generated. And then the process to determine how that money gets spent is sort of still underway. And there's an effort afoot to try to get some of that money back to the local level so that we can use it to implement our climate action plans. There's a lot of competition for money, as you can well imagine. And the article in today's paper is about how the governor is looking to have some of that money to help balance the statewide budget, not necessarily even related to greenhouse gas issues. So um, I'm, I'm not fully aware of all the details of that last little part there, but this is an important thing that it's, there's going to be more money coming. It wasn't just a one-time thing, and we really need to try to make sure that some of it, at least, is getting invested in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and it would be wonderful if some of it was coming back down to the local level to do some of the projects that we need to do here. So those are just a few things, and uh, I think that wraps it up. So thank you, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions if anyone has them. Yes. Excuse me. The question was, the, the program that's called the California First Pace program, I mentioned that um, right now it's available to businesses, but not... Uh, homes because of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac restrictions. And her question was, if you don't have a loan from Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, can you, in op can you utilize that program? And I'm not sure the answer to that, but I'll check back and let you know. Um, I was trying to think if I ever heard that. I don't know. I just don't know. Yes. So the question was, could a residential housing complex use the, the commercial PACE program? And I believe the answer to that is yes. Yeah. Yes, Peter. Um, I'm, inter <clears throat> I'm interested on that wind thing on the wharf. What is it being used for? <clears throat> and can other businesses buy into that? I mean, is it just 
Um, I think it's just being used to generate power right now that's used to the building that it's on and it's not generating any excess power. It's a really, it's a pretty small windmill. Um, but the goal of that was to try to figure out how much wind is generated out there and whether the wharf site is an opportunity to have wind on the roofs to help power those businesses. And a follow-up is then, what's the time element to figure all that out? Uh, so the question, what's the time element to figure all that out? And again, I don't know exactly the answer to that. I think it's, well, they just got their permit extended to 2014. So I think they've got a several year process where they're trying to collect data. Yes, Daryl. Um, okay, so the questions were on the windmill on the wharf. Who did the permits have to come from that held it up? Take a guess. Coastal Commission. <laughs> right. <laughs> it had to do with it being in the view shed and all of that. Uh, <laughs> um, and then you also mentioned that you're getting your natural gas from Tiger. And yes, natural gas is not locked down the same way that electric power is. So um, again, if you think back to the year 2000, and the reason it's interesting, the reason I remember the year is because, again, that was when I was working with some of the climate change issues for the city, and we, I p had put together a request for proposal for the city to buy 100% green power for all the city facilities. We issued the request for proposal in um, August, and the proposals were due back, I think it was either the end of September or early October, and the power crisis, if you will, hit in between that period and so we only got one proposal and it wasn't really a valid company so that was that was when basically everything went to hell in a handbasket if you will and um, this the state uh, ended up having to bail out the the um, private operators PG&E San Diego Gas and Electric Cal Edison borrowed a bunch of money lots of money to help that process and is the payback of all those loans is on your power bill and is tied into the rates. And so if everybody bailed on PG&E and SDG&E and all those, then the money wouldn't come back in to pay those loans off. So they said, until we get the loans paid off, um, direct access, which is what it was called before, when you could go to Green Mountain Power was one of the big ones or something and buy your power, you can't do that anymore. But it's I think we're um, edging back to the point of that. Um, there, several of the loans I think have been paid off now. So, um, but yeah. <laughs> she wants me to tell you Santa Cruz is normal, but Santa Cruz is never normal, right? Uh, we are way ahead uh, of most, and we are a little behind. The real leaders, which of course are, as you might well guess, places like San Francisco, um, Marin. Marin. On, on this issue, San Jose is pretty far ahead. Um, but we're we're well ahead of most places. I just went to a conference a couple oh, last week, actually week before last, and uh, it was on sustainability, public works and sustainability, and um, many of the things that were being presented as you know really forward moving things we were doing. And so it was very, you know, it was very gratifying to see that. There were, certainly I came away with things that I wish we were doing as well, but no, we're pretty far ahead. Peter. Just economically, it seems like it would really be worth it to tax ourselves and invest in these things. Has that ever been discussed or is that just a no go zone? Um, okay, the question was uh, just economically, as well as environmentally, it seems like it would be to our benefit to tax ourselves, has that ever been discussed, to tax ourselves to fund these programs. Um, it has come up, I don't know, uh, there are a couple of cities that have passed a carbon tax or a climate tax. Um, I don't think it's been proposed to the extent of like, being on a council agenda for discussion. It's been discussed at some meetings I was at. Um, there has been, we've talked about it in our department about a carbon tax, if you will. Um, but I think that's one of the things that we're hoping will come up is how do you, how do you get the funds to fund some of these things? As you can imagine, most of these things cost money 
to get them going. And that may be one of the things that comes out of this community um, focus group. So, yes. Um, I can speak to it ex to the extent that I know. There is Bay Street Reservoir, which is up above High Highland. Um, we are replacing Bay Street Reservoir, and so there were some temporary tanks there, and now they have completed the underground tanks, so they, they put the temporary tanks in, and then they took out the original Bay Street Reservoir, and then they rebuilt those underground tanks for Bay Street Reservoir, and now the temporary tanks are going to be moved out. So those are the only ones I'm aware of. I don't work in the water department, so I don't know a lot about that. Okay. I thought it was happening at the Good Street Plant. Okay. I look at it and all that, but it's, it sounds like two different locations. Okay. Well, Sewage Treatment Plant, um, there are no tanks being added or taken away for wastewater treatment. We have recently, uh, well, we go through a process. We have, di we have digesters there at the, w at the wastewater treatment plant on Bay in California, these big tanks, and the wastewater goes into those tanks, and then um, bacteria break down the solids in the, in the wastewater and create gas, their byproduct is gas, methane, to be, ex to be specific. That methane is then burned on site in a cogeneration system and produces power. And it's a big power generator. It, it, it dwarfs these solar systems. It generates uh, about three and a half gigawatts of power a year, gigawatt hours of power a year. Um, but we haven't replaced any tanks or we're really not building any new tanks there. So. I, um, and the other thing I'm going to mention, I get to toot my own horn a little bit here, the, something that people might not remember. So the wastewater plant generation system that's a renewable power system, that's been there since 1989. So the city way back in 1989 was way ahead of the game then. The other place they were way ahead of the game then is they also entered into an agreement in 1988 and it was constructed in 1989 at the landfill, which is up Highway 1 about three miles to build a landfill gas collection system and a generator to burn that gas to create renewable power. And that system is actually produces even more power than the wastewater plant. It's about 4.3 gigawatts a year, gigawatt hours a year. So those are happening. The one at the landfill, we don't use that much power up there. That system is operated by a franchised business uh, and they pay us royalties. And so they handle the operation of it, and that power is now sold. It used to be sold to PG&E, and now it's fed into the grid, but they're selling it to SMUD, which is Sacramento Municipal Utility District, because SMUD was looking to buy renewable power, and they give them a better price than PG&E did. So several years ago, about four years ago, that, that power started being SMUD's power. Um, all goes into the same wires, of course. But, um, so we have two very large renewable power systems on city facilities. And then in addition to these new um, solar systems at the police station and city hall, we already had four solar power systems. There's one at the wastewater plant, one at the water treatment plant, one downtown on the building that's the library headquarters and the water admin building. And then there was already a small solar system on city hall. So, yes? How much revenue does the one at the dump generate for the city? For the city? Um, not a lot, but about $200,000 a and year. That's from that the, from the landfill? Yes. And, and the revenue we get is just 15% of the gross, so they're making money on they're it, too. Money. And then the other thing is, when you showed the pie chart as the source of energy carbon production, you, I mean, waste, waste your field doesn't look significant, but in fact, that is a more harmful gas. Exactly. It's a smaller percent. Exactly. Methane is about 21 times as powerful as a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide. So we want to keep all the methane out of the air that we can. Yes. That's an excellent that question. It, it, it's, <laughs> that's a great question, and thank you for bringing that up because I didn't explain that. Um, the wires and the distribution system all stays PG&E. All that happens is the power that goes into the power line from wherever that generation source is, is from a different generator. Does PG&E get 
anything? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Actually, right now, uh, one of the things that happened as a result of that power and energy crisis in 2000 is basically the independent operators got told, get out of the power sales business. So they sold off their power plants. They're not really in the business anymore of generating power. Where they're making their money is trans emitting and distributing the power. So they own all the wires, they own all the, all the um, big um, places that you see that have all the buildings and wires. They own those, but they don't own the generating facilities anymore. PG&E or San Diego Gas and Edison or the, the plant in Moss Landing that you see, the, the two, it's not owned by PG&E. I know, that's yeah. weird. So that plant is making power, putting it into the wires that are owned by PG&E, and then PG&E distributes it to wherever it's going, and they charge for the wires, maintaining the wires, the service delivery. They charge an overhead on, on uh, taking the power from whoever's generating it. So that wouldn't change. That part doesn't change. That's the way it is now. So that wouldn't double your No, prices. no. As a matter of fact, um, that's where Marin found that they were able to buy the power and, del and deliver it into the system cheaper than wherever the power was coming from before. So, yeah, it's a, it is very complicated. And frankly, um, I worked with this whole C CCA thing issue uh, about in, in about 2003, 2004. And at that point, I was like, you know, we don't want to get into this right now because it isn't, many of those issues hadn't been figured out. And so I, my recommendation at that time was, no, we don't want to go there. We don't have, we're too small. We don't have the staff. Let somebody else figure it out. So now somebody else has figured it out and has gotten all the way through the process, has done a lot of the legal work and paid for a lot of the legal work with money that we didn't have to spend on it. So now it probably is something that is workable for somebody our size. So. I was just thinking of all this local staff, the city oh, yeah. staff and stuff. That would have yeah, we don't want to be in the energy company business. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Great questions. We've been listening to Mary Arman, Public Works Operations Manager for the City of Santa Cruz, talk about the City of Santa Cruz's Climate Action Plan. This concludes our program for the Democratic Women's Club. See you next time.